Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Nick Vine. I'm the writer of Stone Cop and Death of a Necromancer. You can find me at nickvine.com or nickmb on Twitter. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, you're on Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. He is Part of an amazing team, which we'll touch on during the interview as well, too. The creator of Stone Cop, which I think is one of the most <laughs> epic names I've ever heard for both Police Officer and, of course, the content of this particular comic. The ever-talented Nick Bryan, how are you doing today? Hi, hi, I'm good. It's nearly midnight here, so been less tired, but yeah, I'm at... Uh, what, what is, what's that old saying? A rolling stone gathers no moss, so it doesn't matter what the time is, right? I'm just hoping that applies to my Kickstarter campaign, to be honest. <laughs> there you go. Uh, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Vine. I'm a British indie comics writer. I've been doing this for about five, six years now. I've done Kickstarters starting in 2020 and about one year since then. I did the uh, Urban Fantasy one shot and it snowed and last year I did Death of a Necromancer which was a like whole massive graphic novel which was definitely my biggest thing yes and generally sort of high concept emo I guess a sort of some sort of big idea and then bringing it back to some sort of sincere emotion at the end is I think what I'm normally aiming for but we'll, we'll make you have some fun we'll make you laugh and hopefully we'll make you cry or at least feel sad as long as you come away feeling sad my work is really done is that just your yourself as a writer just bringing your emotions to the page and just getting free therapy out of the deal i mean and also if you happen to meet me to be honest <laughs> um but, but yeah I try, I try to bring something to it i mean in some ways that's the challenge like i mean you come up with something like stone cop obviously he's a cop made of stone very much going for the self-explanatory elevator pitch there but and, I, and after that you just sort of try and get to what's you know, human or interesting or relatable or again, sad about the concept of Stone Cop and just sort of work back from that and bring that together with the fun stuff. And that's the enjoyable part of the writing process for me. So talk about Stone Cop here itself. What is what was the elevator pitch? How did this come about? And what was the first image that kind of came to mind once you started brainstorming and working this together with your amazing team? Well, in this particular case, it was actually sort of artist first. I'd spoken to Phil Apley, the artist of Stone Cop, a little bit on Twitter. And we've been talking a little bit about working together. And he came to me about two, two and a half months ago and said, Nick, Nick, I've got some free time. Let's finally do something together. Because he'd really enjoyed Death of a Necromancer. And so, yeah, he wanted to try and make something work. So we talked for a bit about the sort of thing he wanted to do, which is obviously nice as long as you can, you know, come up with the idea. When the artist comes to you and says, I want to do something, it's got to be something like this. And yeah, because obviously you're going to get quite good work out of them, which I think you can see in Phil's oh, pages yeah. for Stone Cop. We were talking about the idea of sort of, I think he wanted to do something quite action orientated, sort of urban action. I've done a lot of urban fantasy, as you can sort of tell if you go and look at my my backlog. There's a lot of magic in cities or magic in modern towns in my stories. So we sort of brought that together. So whereas a lot of my previous stuff has been kind of an average person finds a magic thing and ends up sad, obviously. Um, uh, Stone Cop, yeah, it was more about the big action hero, the the big the big bad Stone Cop, by experiencing the magic and going through it, and then inevitably becoming sad. Yeah, that, so that, we tried to bring our influences together. That's what I noticed first off. I mean, it felt like in action movies from the eighties. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> like it had that it had that feel of like if 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 you've put Arnold Schwarzenegger as Stone Cop, I I would have been sold at the movie theaters right then and there. Like that, just it has that epicness about it. But if he wants to do it, that's fine. I hear people <laughs> love that guy. <laughs> what is the genre of Stone Cop then? Uh, I think it's probably sort of urban fantasy yeah slash the sort of action cop story you're talking about it's a sort of mashup of those things i mean there's a lot of weirdly i think there's a lot of urban fantasy stories about like cops detectives anti-heroes in trench coats we're all familiar with the sort of yeah. i guess the sort of john constantine hellblazer archetype the sort of 
gruff man in a trench coat with a dark past who investigates a demon and then sort of flicks a cigarette across the road. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of that. So I was sort of moving through that to doing something in that genre, but with this sort of action hero, I guess. Again, that's the sort of the meld between what I tend to do and what Phil wanted to do was something in that line. So I think Phil did mention sort of the movie Bright as attempting something similar. That famously, I don't know, wasn't that good. So we're going to give it another go. It was kind of, But yeah, that was kind of the way me and Phil ended up combining our influences. For the record, that's why the city in Stone Cop is called Brighton Ridge. It's a small homage to the the fact that Phil mentioned the movie Bright at a very early point in development. Well, then what is the most misunderstood aspect about the urban fantasy or the urban genre that many people who don't follow it misunderstand? I think there's a an expectation it's going to be quite static or possibly quite waffly like there's going to be a lot of people again in trench coats or in the shadows talking in detail about their deals with the devil and stuff the idea of urban plus fantasy there's a lot of space within that like you know obviously but the original urban fantasy thing for a lot of my generation was buffy the vampire slayer mm -hmm. back in the day and i think sort of combined sort of action hero stuff with the urban fantasy stuff and i think there's a bit more scope for doing that sort of stuff moving around within it because I do, I do still find it quite fascinating as i say i've done what is this this is four kickstarters now and a lot of them have been in the, the vague urban fantasy area but we're sort of really exploring it you know really gonna make sure i use all that up kickstarters are like a second job usually when it comes to you know the promotion of it as well as you know the the tiers and everything like that while this campaign is currently ongoing and we'll, we'll touch on when it ends obviously as well too later on here but what are some of the tiers that you are expecting a high result for and what are some tiers that you brought this time around that are interesting and unique compared to maybe other campaigns that you've done i think i'm doing for the first time in this campaign which i haven't because I don't know, just discovered a new level of arrogance. I've actually been offering some scripts reviews, like the idea of, yeah, if you back at this tier, I'll have a look at your comic script of up to 24 pages. I'll give some notes on it and stuff. And it's, yeah, it's something I've always, I've seen a lot of other creators do it. And I've been a bit, maybe a bit cagey about doing it before, because I don't know, maybe I feel like it implies a certain amount of arrogance, but I feel like I can offer something. I've, I've got a master's in creative writing, he says like he's reading out his CV. And, uh, you know, I've been a member of a feedback-based writing group for about a decade, which I go to every fortnight, which I was actually at earlier this evening in the, the normal middle part of the evening. I do do a lot of that, a lot of a lot of feedback stuff. I was on the, the Comics Experience forums. I don't know if you've encountered Comics Experience. It's a sort of comics education program, and one of the things they have is a sort of workshop forum. So I was on that for a while, giving feedback to scripts, and yeah, so I thought it was time to finally bring that to the Kickstarters. So yeah, that's the, the big new thing this time. And obviously we've got a lot of commissions from Phil as well. If other creators are watching and you want to cover from Phil for your indie comic, we are offering that reward. That's really a cool. I, I've seen a couple other campaigns that, that do that as well, too. And it's great to see because the art is beautiful. I'm sure Phil creates some amazing things uh, for whoever decides to, to pick up that particular tier. Speaking of your team itself here, you've already hinted at who they are here. But how did you connect with these amazing, talented people? And what was your first experiences with them? Phil Apley, I did a tweet in some point towards the end of last year saying, oh, I'm I'm looking for someone to do a comic with. I've got some spare time coming up. Yeah, or always interested in the prospects of any artist making himself available. I think I replied to that. We spoke on DM and didn't, he didn't end up going with me that time, but then apparently liked my stuff enough to come back to me a few months later. And we, yeah, again, we got talking. And DC Hopkins, the letterer, um, is, to be honest, he's been part of my sort of team, I guess, for quite a while. He lettered, I think, one of the first two or three comics I ever did, which was a four-page Christmas story drawn by Rob Ahmed, who also drew my Necromancer graphic novel last year. I like to try and keep the same people around for as long as possible. It's like, it's comfortable. <laughs> Met DC Hopkins through Rob Ahmed, because I think Rob had worked with him before on a few things. And yeah, he's, he's great, DC Hopkins. I have no, no complaints whatsoever. He's incredibly good. He's incredibly pleasant. He's incredibly quick. Yeah, I've enjoyed working with him for a long time. Uh, last Yeah, last year when I did the graphic novel, I got him to design a whole book and he nailed that as well. So yeah, I was very happy to bring him back for Stone Cup. That's really good. You know, it's great having a, a wonderful team together that you're, well, like you said, comfortable and are, are easy to work with and put out uh, professional results. So it's even better on all three aspects. Yeah, no, DC is great. I think he's, I think he's increasingly getting a lot of work in the sort of mage TV area. I think he's been doing a few of Scott Snyder's books recently or something like that, but I'm very happy he still comes back to do my Kickstarter stuff because yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Big fan. Is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work will feel after reading Stone Cop? I think the comic, one of the comics for one of the first sort of non-superhero comics I read, I guess, when I was a teenager was kind of Preacher. And there's something in that that sort of got into me, I think. Like Preacher 
and a lot of Garth Ennis's other work. Like, the, yeah, Preacher, obviously, the, uh, for those who don't know, I guess, the sort of biblical urban fantasy comic, sort of urban fantasy western by Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon from the late 90s. And I think the, the feeling it had was this sort of, at times, quite dark jokes and quite extreme sort of plays on genre tropes, but also this, like, real uplifting humanity. Like, why a lot of Garth Ennis's stuff is good is that his characters really, really feel like people. He's really good at that, which really grounds a lot of the, at times, really stupid stuff that happens around them. I mean, my sense of humour is quite different to Garth Ennis's. I, there's a, a lot of places he goes that I would be too scared to go but yeah i think there's a there's something in that i think there's a certain a sort of idea of this sort of core of humanity as i was sort of saying earlier about you go through the sort of the genre stuff and the big silliness and eventually you get to the fact that it's some sort of human story and i think yeah i possibly have kind of carried that forward from reading a lot of garth ennis in my my formative years what was an early experience where you learned that language had power Ooh, this is quite tragic. But I think I was probably watching The West Wing as a teenager and feeling a swell of emotion on the big speeches. Like, I just remember remember some of those really getting to me, which is impressive. So a lot of those were about American patriotism, and I am obviously a British man who has literally never set foot in America. But I hear it's lovely. But, yeah, I, or so they tell me in The West Wing. But, yeah, I... If anything, I always found that almost even more impressive that a lot of these, you know, ideals, places, specifics are things I have no actual experience of or grounded feelings towards. But there's still some power coming from me from the language which makes me, you know, feel these things about them. And yeah, I mean Aaron Sorkin has his flaws, which you, you see increasingly as you grow older and develop your faculties. But yeah, the, the things you can actually do with language and rhetoric and giving you that sort of inspiration did stay with me, I think. He's an, an interesting writer. You like him or leave him type deal. It depends on your, your mood. And I think David <laughs> Finch for me is another one that's kind of like hit or miss sometimes, at least for me. <laughs> Yeah, so Sorkin, when he's good, he's really good, but I don't know. I, I sort of part of me feels, and this is me coming from experience because I did do this, you can slightly overdose on him, I think. I think it's possible to just maybe just watch his really, really good stuff like The West Wing and The Social Network and yeah. maybe a couple of other things and just have a fine time yeah. and maybe not watch everything else. You know, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? The second wisest, the the most, not quite as good as the first. Uh, there are times when this isn't true, but the, the thing that does apply a lot of the time for me is the idea of sort of questioning the first draft. Like the first draft, I think a lot of the time, even when you think you've cracked something, it, it, you often find you've actually done quite a standard tropey approach. Like your first draft or even your first like idea, if you're taking notes about a possible new concept or a possible new brilliant idea you might do. I think you're often your very first idea or the very first thing that came to mind. It'll often be the sort of obvious version, even if it's a slightly masked version of that, that you've managed to get past yourself. And I, I think it's worth, I don't know, if you have time, <laughs> sticking things in the drawer and trying to come back and find the next most interesting alternative. You know, if possible, try and do this before you've written like six drafts of your first idea. But yeah, I think that's a bit of advice I was given, I think, on my creative writing MA. And that's, there are times when you nail it on the first draft. So I myself have occasionally nailed it on the first draft. There are, a lot of the time, it's worth sitting with it a bit. Naming characters as well, too. I, I did, a, <laughs> that was the one thing that was kind of like hammered into our heads. It's like, I don't care if it's man one or woman one or whatever it is, you know, just put a name to them and then come back to them after. You can always change their names later. Yeah, although if you put a, once you put a name to them, I guess, kind of like like a pet or something, you run the risk of getting attached to it and then not wanting to change it. Unless the character decides to like speak to you and change it in themselves. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm a Bob. I feel like I'm an Andrew. Okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Important, but subtle distinction. You know, what challenges do comic creators, whether they're writers or artists, face in today's society that needs to be addressed in society as i walk down the street i think i think probably it's something like what makes me unique i guess that's kind of the hardest one sometimes but also one of the bigger ones like i i don't know i feel like especially in like sort of vaguely sort of western comics field i mean i mean it used to be the case that it was just every possible take on superheroes that have been done but it, over the last like 10 15 years as other genres have started to come up and a lot of them have been sort of sci-fi fantasy genre stuff yeah there's been a lot of books from people like image and boom and so on mm -hmm. and there's a lot of comics and there's a other score all the kickstarter comics as well I ideally you would read them all to try and make sure you've got a full picture of it but some say that's poker chip the idea that a lot of these genres are now getting a lot of play due to the increased volume of these various books and kickstarters and stuff and i think it's still worth trying to keep some idea of a i don't know what makes me unique and what 
I mean, even if it's the vo- if it's the voice rather than the idea, because I am also aware of the concept that you know there are no original ideas. Most things have been done at some point in some way. I am 100% sure that if I spent 20 minutes on Google, I would find another comic, film, TV show, or fan fiction story online about a stone cop. But, you know, the, uh, so yes, to an extent, yes, the, the unique angle is my voice, my angle, my perspective on it. But there's still, that, that's still something. There's still got to be something there. The, I, I guess it's kind of similar to what I said about accepting the first draft. That has to be, much as you'd like the idea of just knocking yourself away from the world and being a an independent writer who just produces their genius and gives it to everybody so they can power before it or something there has to be a, i think a sub sense of okay what's what's the new thing what's the interesting thing what's the unique thing i think i think that's possibly one of the bigger challenges a thousand monkeys doing out your stories while you just <laughs> reap the benefits uh you know I, I think we can only deal with what we can deal with and and hopefully we come up with something amazing yeah i, I can't get a thousand monkeys i can't afford to pay them all individually but... uh, yeah bananas are pretty expensive these days you know <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah especially here brexit man brexit. Oh, okay. When you first put together this script and you gave the script to Phil and he gave you a piece of artwork back, what was the piece of artwork that you got back that was way better than what you had written on the page? The first bit that really blew me away, I mean, uh, Phil, if you're listening, obviously it's all amazing. You're a wonderful artist and a spectacular human being. But the part that really, I think, yeah, surpassed my expectations entirely and made me think okay this is a thing this is great was probably page two of the comic which is you know one of the pages that's up on the kickstarter page so by all means please head over and marvel at it like i did but yeah it's the sort of page of stone cop coming towards the camera with the the big logo below him which really made sold the whole sort of yeah like you said sort of action cop movie vibe we were going for and that was like okay this is real this is a thing this exists because, like, I mean, partly, I mean, probably helped by the fact that Stone Cop isn't really on page one, and we haven't done the cover yet. So all I've really seen was a couple of sketchy character designs. But yeah, so that big sort of pin-up Stone Cop debut thing on page two was when, yeah, Phil gave me that. So I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there it is. There it is. We got it. We can do this. Yeah, the, the color palette is just beautiful, too. It just, it just fits. Everything fits. The, I have no complaints about it whatsoever. It is just such an amazing comic. Like... I can't wait to to pick up a digital copy of it and, and really flip through it because I want to see more of it in the future. I really do. Like if this isn't a three issue arc or or make it an omnibus or whatever the case may be, I will be disappointed slightly. Well, uh, well, it's it's a self contained short story. In the event that we mega explode, I could probably do a sequel. I could probably think of a couple of ideas off the top of my head. Hopefully, one of them's good after a few drafts. But yeah. Uh, we could do a sequel, but for now we're stick. But doing a self-contained story, you know, maximum back of satisfaction. It's all there. You've got it. It's it's finished. Yeah, for no. now, that works so well. <laughs> That's good. At least you know when to stop. Some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, like 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 a lot of sort of comic readers of from the who came in through like superheroes and stuff. I have a lot of affection for like massive, long, ongoing serials. I get I get how we all end up wanting to do one. I myself suffer from the vague desire to do one. But yeah, it's important to work out what the stories are that can actually support it. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? <laughs> um, I think probably just from sort of extrapolating from real life, much like stories do nowadays. Like, I don't know, I could, a guy in the olden days going, how, how, how could I kill that mammoth? Would, would I kill the mammoth better if I jumped off the rocks? Or if I was a, a trench coat wearing badass with 96 guns. Uh, yeah, I, I think you just sort of go from there to, okay, you, once you've gone from, okay, if I run over there or I run around that corner or if I have the ability to fly, I think it's, I, th- I think to be honest, you just sort of speculate and extrapolate and go from there. And then before you know it, you're telling long rambling stories to your your kids about exactly how you would kill a mammoth with 96 guns. uninvented weaponry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the next, uh, in, instead of Stone Cop, it's going to be the assassin with 96 guns, you know, uh, <laughs> killing mammoths. So, <laughs> time travel, there you go. <laughs> yeah, man with 96 guns versus mammoths. Yeah, I could probably make that sad. I need to work out exactly how, but I'll think about it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Weirdly, the, the person who inspired me to actually 
flip over and make comics because I've been sort of trying to get around to it for a while and try and saying I would do it and getting around to it was the hosts of Silence, which is a British comics podcast I've listened to for much longer than I've been making comics. They used to meet up every week and talk about comics they'd read and then they started to talk about the comics they'd made as well alongside that. And yeah, I don't know really. Um, I just, just because I knew they were just guys who lived in Britain and I've met them a few times at events and stuff. And it, yeah, I don't really know. I don't, I don't know if they really set out to inspire people or make making comics seem possible in a sort of evangelical way. But yeah, for some reason, those were the guys who were doing it and doing it really, really well and seeming to enjoy it and have fun with it, which made me think, oh, I want to do that. Yes, I've liked comics for a long time. That's the next step. And yeah, I think I have mentioned to the, it to them and I think they mostly just found it awkward. I dread to think how they'll feel if they ever watch this. But yeah, those are the two people, two people, one podcast who kind of, I think, ended up inspiring me to where I now am. Fraser Geeson and Dan White of the Silence Podcast, guys, that's yeah to you. I'm going to name you on the podcast as well, just in case it wasn't awkward. From a professional standpoint, you have created multiple comics. You are now in a Kickstarter campaign for this current one for Stone Cop, and I'm sure you have many more uh, in the pipe and in the queue ready to go for future events, which I can't wait to have you back on to talk about this uh, in the future. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I mean, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, could always work on the old social skills, but, you know, I have a, a lovely partner who makes my, my Kickstarter videos. There's action figure Stone Cop over my shoulder there, which she made for this. And I have a roof over my head. I don't really have a high barrier for personal success. It would be nice to have untold riches, but I kind of view that as kind of out of reach unobtainable. So, yeah. I'm I'm fine. If I had untold riches, I'd probably just spend it on making comics. Not not a bad way to go, right? I I, I don't think so. No. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I, I I'd love to say I sort of pivot brilliantly and immediately towards sort of a positive, better outcome. It's I do sort of get there, but it's normally after a period of what I would describe as intense self pity. It's normally by basically entirely shunning the thing I was working on and grimly going to work on something else for a bit just to enjoy the experience of that seeming to work and eventually once I've worked on that to the point that I feel a bit better and I've actually had some fun I will maybe re-engage a bit with whatever I failed at it's not yeah it's so it's sort of yeah you, you could characterize that as stomping off and throwing a tantrum I guess but at least it's usually a productive tantrum that, that's productive that's good that's that's fine it's just, happiness is fine hmm. the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a comic writer or a writer or something creative in some way shape or form that you've inspired them to become how can they inspire the generation that follows them um i think a lot of the legacy is just as a creative person a lot of your legacy is just having again kind of similar to something i said earlier having something to say that's actually specific and unique but actually gives the generation after you something to react to like i think just just saying something that's actually specific to the time we currently live in or actually has a voice or a comment or an angle and actually has actually clearly thought about things and saying something other than just i too have read the same old comics as you i think once you if you actually have something to say that is specific to the time and the place then that's going to be the thing that the next generation will look at. And, you know, some of them might look at it and think, wow, that's inspiring. I, t I could do that. You know, kind of like me and the hosts of Silence. Or alternatively, they could think, wow, screw them. They're wrong. I'm going to, they're wrong and I'm going to prove it. And yeah, but either way, I think that's in a lot of ways, the way you end up inspiring the next generation by giving them something to react to and sort of push off them. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? If that but it, I am not good at titles, so this is going to be a long road to not much. Uh, I think the soundtrack would probably end up being a sort of, I don't know, a lot of what I listen to is, uh, this is actually something else I've got from Garth Ennis. A lot of what I've listened to has ended up being like slightly sleazy Irish punk music or things like the Pogues. Or I think, I don't know, if, I don't, I don't actually know how big they are in America, but the, the Sleaford Mods, the sort of British post-punk bands who are like basically one man doing sort of electronic music and another man shouting over it and again it's sort of slightly scuzzy and it's like, it's like a man shouting about how bad everything is but in a sort of vaguely i hope it'll get better way it's one of those things where perhaps it's slightly hard to describe it in an appealing sounding way i suspect kind of yeah kind of similar to what i was saying about the tone of my work i think probably a lot of the soundtrack would be something a bit like that you know it's got grim stuff in it but there's a, a tone that things will hopefully improve and yeah and what would a good title be 
I don't know. I seem to spend half my life just sitting in the corners of pubs and cafes trying to sort of staring at people passing by and writing stuff. I think it would probably just be something something slightly sedate, like The Man in the Corner, which just makes it sound like some sort of crime novel. But the, 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 the real secret is just, is all the action, all the real actions inside my head and nothing really ever happens. But, but there is an incredibly good soundtrack. Hey, uh, titles can always be rewritten. Just give it to your editor, right? Is that, that's, that's yeah, that, that's definitely one of the first draft things that needs, <laughs> needs work. We'll, we'll be coming back to the first idea and working on it till it improves just, just like naming characters you know give give your editor the the job of the title and away you go <laughs> i need to focus on the important stuff here that, that's my dream that's one of the things that the first things i'm planning on doing if and when i actually succeed yes i'm delegating titles well nick i do hate to say but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for Fair coming enough. on the show no it's okay thank you very much for having me it's been great before i let you go where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing Kickstarter campaign and when does it end? Uh, the Stone Cop campaign ends on the 8th of June. And yep, uh, if you can find it by going to my Twitter, which is Nick MB, that's M for Matthew, B for Brian, where I will be talking about it pretty incessantly. Also on nickbrian.com or on Instagram, which is just nickbrian.com written out. Or I think if you just type kickstarter.nickbryan.com into a web browser, it should come up. And yeah, then you can see the Stone Cop campaign and, um, as Kurt said, all of Phil's amazing artwork and hopefully give us a back. It's a, yeah, it's a really lovely looking comic. It's a really fun story. I'm really, really proud, proud of it. Please take a look. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview in a thousand, well, actually more like 1200 plus others since 2008 on our website tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com website's going through a revamp so go to our youtube channel which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia the podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons and you know i'm only one person give me a break that's twogeekstalking.podbean.com but search for two geeks talking the word two not the number two on any of your favorite streaming services you get your podcasts on which is itunes spotify and literally everything else because it is there and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking